Thanks everyone for coming. I really appreciate folks showing up at this late hour in the day. I'm sure you're a little bit fried. Uh, I'm definitely a little bit fried, so this will be fun. We'll all be in it together. Um, this is a talk that's ostensibly a solutions track talk, and I admit that I will show some of LightStep's product in this, but it's really mostly intended to be a story about distributed tracing, how that differs from distributed traces and things like that. Uh, and so I hope it will be interesting and useful to people beyond the product pitch, which this is not intended to be. So uh, let's get started with a critique of observability in general. I have uh, a lot of thoughts on this subject, but I'll try to get it, keep it quick. Uh, the conventional wisdom runs something like this. Uh, it's difficult to observe microservices. Anyone who's running them even a little bit has probably run into this. Uh, Google and Facebook solved this, and among other things, they had metrics, logs, distributed tracing. Uh, so we should too. All right, that's, not the, that's a reasonable place to start. Um, this is uh, often referred to as the three pillars of observability. So you have these three brilliant Brilliance of Britishism, right? I say brilliant here instead of awesome or something, right? Um, these, these three uh, brilliant things, it holds up your observability, scaffolding, and everything is fine. So um, this is not uh, reasonable. I had this uh, same cartoon in my earlier presentation. Uh, I just love this cartoon. I don't know what's so great about it. But let's um, talk about them. So there's a much longer version of this talk that I did at KubeCon uh, where I really dig into the specifics of the problems with each one of the observability pillars. They're all totally valuable, to be clear, but not as a solution unto themselves. Uh, and to cut to the chase, um, these are, this is a table that tries to summarize the issues with each. Uh, I'm, we're already half an hour into my KubeCon talk, so you've saved a lot of time. I should have just should have done it this way there. It would have been much more efficient. But uh, with logs, it's really difficult to log everything in a microservices architecture that you want because you want to know about when each transaction visits each service. And if that's all that you do and that's it, and you want to centralize all that without sampling, then you're going to be in a world of pain. I met uh, the, someone who was responsible for logging at a major internet brand, I won't say which, uh, and I asked him how they, what their internal policy is around logging and microservices, and he said, it's very simple, don't do it. Okay, so, um, and this is because the TCO is too high. It's not because it's not useful. It's very useful to be able to search logs. I wish we could do it, but you can't store all that data because the data has grown with your microservice count, not with uh, the value of the data. Um, so when, when the, the cost is not growing proportional to value, that's bad. Um, for metrics, I think it's also fairly well known that there's a cardinality problem. Uh, in my talk earlier today, uh, which some of you may have been at, the, um, I think it's really important to be able to explain variance. Uh, the, the way you do that with metrics is by grouping by a tag, basically. I mean, TLDR, that's what most people do with metrics. And that's really awesome, it's very useful, except that if the tag has too many values, then things break down uh, uh, from a cost standpoint as well. So metrics have a TCO problem when you have high cardinality tags. Are people familiar with this problem? A show of hands, cardinality. Not everyone, hmm. Let me see if I have a slide about this. If I do, uh, darn. Hmm. Well, the, uh, the gist of it is that you, um, uh, if you have a tag in a metric system, so you have a time series, you probably can't afford to have more than 100 or so values for that tag. So let's say you had a tag like, I don't know, um, host name or, something, or a container ID, that would not be a good tag because you're going to have so many containers that the cost of that metric is going to exceed its value. Uh, so that's the problem with metrics. And then distributed traces have this other problem, which is that they have historically dealt with um, the logging cost problem by sampling aggressively. So in Dapper, we sampled one out of every 10,000 traces for centralization. Uh, that has a lot of benefits from uh, like a disk space standpoint, but it has a lot of huge drawbacks from an analytical standpoint. So this is why distributed tracing metrics and logs don't make for good solutions on their own. Uh, I 
like this, uh, this game you can play. You design your own observability solution. So you want high throughput, so you want a lot of data because you're running a big application with lots of users. You want high cardinality because uh, we were just talking about how useful it is. If you have a high cardinality system, you can, uh, you can analyze things more easily. You don't want any sampling. And you want to be able to look back at least a couple of weeks so that you can have a baseline. And then you get to choose three. So that's the game. You can choose any three, and there probably is something out there that's promising all the benefits of having those three things, but it kind of ignores the other one that you want as well. Um, this is almost a law of nature, at least with current hardware, so no one has like a silver bullet for this. It's just the way it is. Um, all right, so metrics, logs, and traces, totally valuable as a data source, not valuable as a solution. Uh, and that's, that's something that I don't think has been widely understood. Okay, so th these are our three pillars. I do think that they have value. I'm not saying we should throw them out, to be clear. Um, but to me, it's more like this. They're the three pipes of observability. They've got these three data pipes. They've got things in them that we want, and we need to build something out of it. And that's very different than saying, I've got traces, so I'm done with that pillar. Let's check off the other two. Not a good solution. Not a good solution. All right, so now we're going to talk about um, service-centric observability, which is a term that no one has ever used before right now. I don't know if it'll catch on or not, or even if I'm ever going to say it again. But this is the way that I've been thinking about it lately. Uh, so to a certain extent, I'm testing this on you all. You should come and tell me if this makes sense <laughs> to you. But historically, um, well, actually, before I get there, let me just talk about APM as a, as a, uh, indus well, as a segment of the industry. It's application performance management or monitoring, whatever. It's about the application. And the application is still very important. But my hypothesis is that as service teams have grown around microservices, you, each service team is kind of responsible for their own little mini application or service, really, which is different than the application your users are, you know, your actual end users are using. And you want to have your observability strategy oriented around your service, not necessarily around the application per se. Your service has measurable goals called SLIs, but they're not uh, the same goals that your application has. And I think one of the problems with conventional APM is that it was designed for a, wor a world where you had one giant monolithic application where everything was attached to the end user, and that's just not the case anymore. Uh, you do have users, but your immediate user as a service owner is the service that calls you, not the end user. And it's actually very confusing to have everyone orient around the quote unquote application when really what you care about is your service. So this is a totally, you know, um, invented uh, diagram of a microservices architecture. And I kind of want to talk about um, briefly why we got here. Uh, the keynote this morning, I think, also uh, echoes a lot of what I'm about to say here, which makes me feel like it's actually probably correct. Um, so let's talk about a single service to start. I picked one just at, at random. It's the same story for any one of them. The problem we had with Monolith is that if these were all packages within a monolith instead of services in an architecture. It was necessary for the owner of this package in the monolith to, at some level, depend on all the other packages, at least when you're doing a release. Like, you, I, I did work on monolith. I'm old enough to have worked in monolithic software, and, and we had a couple hundred developers banging on a single Java code base, and you know, the releases were just arduous, arduous, painful processes. Again, the keynote this morning underlined that as well. I'm sure anyone here who's been in that environment remembers what that was like. It was very painful. And so the advantage of microservices, again, is the decoupling of service teams. And it's really about human communication. So um, the human communication needed for this service uh, is really focused on the service itself. So your team members, you need to work with very frequently and you have to have a total mind meld about stuff, but that's fine because there's, what, like five or ten people on your team, no problem. And maybe, let's say, you also kind of need to understand those two. Um, so you need to understand the services that are on either side of you, above and below you potentially, not, not to the same degree, but at least you need to understand what kind of data gets sent back and forth. Um, because if you make a change or if they make a change, you'll need to have some knowledge of that. And so your scope of understanding is really narrow. And that's a wonderful thing. So we can all move much faster. That's the story. And I think it's true. That, that's all true. Uh, 
this yeah, gives us faster releases, smaller teams, and so on. Um, in the service-centric world, where we're intentionally going, where each microservice team owns just their service and only needs to know about their service, there is a catch. Those arrows are actual dependencies. Those are real things. And if E is having a bad day, which happens uh, because of whatever, it doesn't really matter. Uh, maybe I should have made E this guy down here because sometimes the dependency um, didn't even do anything wrong. It's like one of their upstream actors had a bad release and it flooded them or something like that. But the point being, if you have a downstream dependency that's having a bad day, um, that's really problematic uh, because even though you designed your architecture to mirror your organization and to reduce communication patterns, that's actually just made this problem worse in that you did depend on E, E is having a bad day, and you have no way to discover that, uh, at least you know, if you're using tools that were designed to observe B and its immediate neighbors. So that's, in essence, why observability has become a thing. Um, I think that software was simply so easy to observe, relatively speaking, 10 years ago that we didn't need a new word uh, to talk about it. Uh, I wish observability was less than six syllables. It's awfully difficult to say. It's also hard to type, but this is the world we live in. Um, I, I think uh, it's become a thing because you uh, simply cannot uh, re-instrument C, D, E, and redeploy in order to understand what they're doing. The, the term observability dates back to the 60s, and it was uh, from control theory, and it's the idea that you can, um, ob observability is the property of being able to understand a system from its outputs. So the idea is that the system needs to generate enough valuable output that you can understand its behavior uh, looking in from the outside, and the decoupling that took place when you went to microservices has made that much, much, much harder. You would have just looked at a stack trace from E previously, and uh, it would have been fairly obvious how you depended on it. Now that's not so true. Are people kind of with me? Make sense? Okay. I don't, no one's screaming at me anyway. Um, so uh, let's look at a single distributed trace. Um, I think this is a link. Indeed it is. So this is a trace of uh, an application that's kind of like a, a fake Airbnb clone or something like that, but it, you know, it's a real code base uh, and it generates a bunch of data that we can use to analyze. If you haven't seen one before, the basic idea is pretty simple. It's a little bit like you know, the Chrome Network Inspector where you have a shared timeline um, from left to right uh, and you can see um, if I expand this out, we started off in a web application in the client. Uh, we call through to uh, make a request of a proxy. Each of these colors is a different service. Um, the proxy calls a server. The server does some internal work and then eventually calls a cache and then calls a database. And so, you know, intuitively you can understand um, the dependencies in your system with these tree diagrams as well as the relative timing of things. In this particular visualization, we also have a yellow band that's applied to the critical path of the transaction, which is to say the part of the transaction that's actually holding up the end user. If you're interested in latency, you probably only care about the critical path. As an anecdote, before we deployed Dapper or widely deployed Dapper at Google, teams would spend like whole quarters or multiple quarters on performance optimizations to their service. It turned out the service was not on the critical path, and so it literally made no difference at all. Like it has no benefit to anybody, and in fact, it cost them their time and usually some throughput to make that latency improvement. So it's very important to understand the critical path, and um, tracing is is quite adept at visualizing it. So this is a single trace. It definitely, if we go back to, you know, to, um, I wonder how I make this full screen again. Uh, if we go back to the presentation, um, I think it's somewhat evident that that would be useful. This is why people bother with this. Um, if your distributed trace involves service E, you have a lead on what's going on there. Uh, and I think it is actually pretty reasonable to use distributed traces alone to find um, really egregious performance problems that are downstream. So if you're responsible for service B and service E is like completely on fire, you'll probably be able to see at least that much truth just from a distributed trace. You won't know why, but at least you'll know that it's on fire. So distributed tracing is useful, and, or distributed traces are useful. Um, uh, you have one distributed trace. Oh yeah, whoops, I meant to say one more thing um, about these traces. Each one of these, segments that are timed is called a span. Uh, 
Um, each span uh, is allowed to have tags on it, which are just key value pairs, uh, typically unlimited in terms of cardinality and stuff like that. And they also have little uh, like kind of micro logs that are attached to them as well. In this case, we have a log saying that the cache had no available connections and then reconnected. And that, in fact, is what the delay was in this particular span. So each span has its own little miniature log. And they also have key value tags to help contextualize what's going on. In this case, we have the customer ID and the subnetwork this thing was running on. Um, in terms of, uh, what have I done? Uh, in terms of um, a single distributed trace, uh, it's valuable because we can cross microservice boundaries and see really obvious issues. And I think that they are absolutely necessary in a very literal sense of the word if we want to understand the relationships between different parts of our system. I would posit that it's not feasible. If you have a microservice architecture that's multiple layers deep, it's not just like a hub and spoke model, but actually has multiple layers calling each other. I don't even, I do not understand how you, under, how you make sense of that system without distributed traces in some capacity. So that's, that's all well and good. Um, the problem is that uh, there are way too many of them to centralize in a standard way. This gets back to the fatal flaws slide. You can't just put all of them into Elasticsearch and expect it to be reasonable from an ROI standpoint. It's just too much data. And uh, back on the too much data uh, you know, kick, there's so much in that, tra like that one trace we were looking at wasn't even that large. Traces from, like, real traces from production systems, like the ones we see at LightStep and our customers, that trace, I think, had 35 or 40 spans in it. We have many, 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 many traces in our system with thousands of spans. And the total size of the trace is well into the tens of megabytes. And when you're doing that, it's not uh, just a data cost issue. Our brains are not sufficiently powerful to absorb that much data and find the patterns that are in there. There are some very valuable patterns to find. We cannot find them on our own. And uh, the whole hypothesis of this talk is that uh, those patterns need to be found and that if we can find ways to reveal them, we'll have something very valuable on the other side. Right. So distributed traces are structs. They're not a solution. And distributed tracing is not one thing. There are many different types of distributed tracing. Some of them are totally in process. Some of them look like Dapper or Zipkin, some of them are totally different. Um, distributed tracing is a whole category. It's an art and a science, and it's a very young one. Uh, we're just scratching the surface of what's possible uh, with that discipline. And I would argue, totally biased here, this is a sponsor talk, so I'm allowed to say this, um, that distributed traces are the most important data signal you have in a microservice architecture if you're trying to understand it. Because they're the only signal that understands dependencies between services, and those are where most of the interesting problems come up. Um, I, don't know how you, I, don't, I don't know how you would address those problems to anything else. Um, you could argue that traces are just made out of events. I find that to be a little bit like saying, well, traces are made out of bytes. It's like, yeah, okay, whatever. I mean, the point is that you need to understand the relationship between the events, and that's what a trace is. Uh, uh, if, you, if you're using a pure event or a, a structured logging solution on its own, that is definitely valuable, and it has its place. But without the relationships between the events and the causality between the events, it's very difficult to do most of the analyses I think are most useful. So I do think of them as being the fundamental building block. All right, so how am I doing on time? Oh, pretty good. So um, let's talk about um, SLIs. So this is uh, just another TLA, a three-letter acronym. Um, uh, service level indicator is uh, an indicator of health for a single service. Typically, a service will have like three to five things it does that are really important. The SLIs are probably just latency, error rate, and throughput for those three to five things. Almost certainly your SLIs. There might be others, but I doubt it uh, for most services. There are many other things that you might care about, but those are the things that you're users or your callers care about. And so the point of an SLI is these are the things on which your service will be judged, not these are the things that make your service work. It's not about your dependencies. It's about the things that are above you in the stack. Um, there are only two goals. We either need to gradually improve an SLI or we need to rapidly restore an SLI. Um, gradually improving, this takes a long time, so it might be like I've got a month and I'm going to try and make my 99th percentile latency 50% faster or something like that. That's gradually improving. 
rapidly restoring is um, I'm woken up at three in the morning and I need to find what I have to roll back as soon as possible. They're, um, they're very different uh, kind of mindsets, <laughs> obviously. Uh, and one is a break fix thing, one is a much more principled, let's, let's look around kind of thing, but both are related to SLIs. And I think performance work that's not about an SLI is a waste of time, uh, and incidents that aren't about an SLI um, also are a waste of time. Like, that's why I don't think you should have alerting rules for the things you, your internal implementation details. The alerting rules should be based on your performance to uh, your callers or you're going to drive yourself crazy. Um, there's basically two activities, one is detecting these SLIs with a lot of precision, and the other is explaining uh, when they vary. Um, uh, I'll get into this in the rest of the talk, but the, um, the detection piece uh, is more than just measuring P99. I think ideally you get very, very precise about the SLI so you can pick it apart and understand its components. Uh, and uh, the variance uh, can be in time, it can be across the latency distribution, and then it's usually an iterative process. It's rare that you can look at an SLI and immediately get to the heart of what's going on. Your process has to be an iterative one. Um, oh yeah, that's, that's this slide. Cool, so let's get back to this diagram. Uh, so given any service, we have to start with an SLI, uh, we have to find variance, and then explain that variance. That's pretty much, in my mind, what service-centric observability should be about. This is true both for the case where you have a month to make an improvement and the case where things are totally on fire. Um, on, you know, when things are on fire, the variance is that it's on fire, obviously, and you're trying to explain it. But this is the basic process. And, uh, and the types of approaches we take from a tooling standpoint are actually remarkably similar, I think, in these two, in these two cases. All right, so now we're at the show and tell part of this. Uh, this is a vendor talk, so I feel like I'm entitled to show the product, but I want to be clear that if I could show this in an abstract way, I would do that. Instead, I don't like vendor talks and their product pitches because it's just frustrating, um, but uh, I will have to show the product here a little bit. So this is a specific microservices architecture. It's the same one we were looking at earlier. Again, it's kind of like an Airbnb clone. Um, the uh, API server is the service we'll look at in this case. That's sort of arbitrary as well. Uh, I was trying to match the diagram from earlier. Uh, this service takes things that come in from a front end proxy and then distributes them to various back ends. It's not important to understand the details of this application, so I won't do that. Uh, so uh, what I want to show first is um, discovering the variants um, and how we can represent an SLI around performance very clearly, um, how we measure high percentile latency, and uh, the idea of performance as a shape, and then we'll, we'll look at a couple of traces. So um, this is, uh, yeah, so this is um, all the services that we saw earlier in that diagram. I can, you know, select which service I want. This is just allowing us to see um, the operations that the service does. I can filter it to be ingress, which means things that are inbound operations I serve. Likely these are the things that your consumers above you are depending on. So there are reasonable places to start for SLIs. I'll kind of arbitrarily choose this reserve asset thing. Um, and now what we see is a histogram. So a lot of people um, are used to seeing time series data, so I do want to pause and say this is not time series data. Um, the stuff over here is really slow, so this is a histogram. This is uh, an entire minute of data, an uh, entire minute of duration. The things over here are incredibly fast. This is one microsecond of duration, and it's a log scale in between. So what you're seeing here is just the frequency of various uh, um, reserve asset calls for this particular service. Um, we have overlaid P95 here. If I want, I can say I'm interested in P90 or P99, but notice that since this is a histogram, the percentile is just a vertical line in this graph. Um, I do think it's valuable to measure high percentile latency. If you look at P50, that's way over here. This is a log scale diagram and you're missing all the interesting stuff, which is this mystery over here. I think as a human being, especially as naturally curious human beings, we want to understand what these bumps are. Um, it's actually a very difficult thing for a computer to know which bumps are interesting. Even my, I presented my four-year-old daughter was looking over my shoulder at one of these diagrams the other day, 
and she asked, what are all those bumps? And I asked her to count them, and she counted a very different number of bumps than I would count. Um, it's interesting how, you know, as you become an experienced operator, you, you hone in on different uh, features of these graphs. But this is the basic idea in my mind that performance really is a shape. If you're thinking of performance as a single percentile, I think that's okay, but it's definitely better than looking at average latency, but it's important to see the shape because the shape will actually reveal different patterns of behavior and you want to be able to focus on those different patterns separately. Um, I, uh, if I want to, uh, I, can, um, I can sort this and just open a couple of traces, uh, new tabs. So, you know, here's a fast one, uh, here's a slower one. And we can look at, um, I think this is the fast one, no. Oh uh, yeah, this, is a, this one's about 300 milliseconds, and I can scroll through this and try to figure out what's going on. Um, this is the slow one, I can scroll th through this and try to figure out what's going on, and you can start to see some patterns. Like, it's obvious that this span has something to do with the slow traces, and uh, in the fast traces, it's maybe not so obvious what the issue is. Um, I, again, I'm trying to emphasize that these individual traces are of some value, like I get something out of this. Uh, they're not useless, oops, um, but, uh, the, um, the value I get from them is somewhat limited because I'm left as a human being to understanding these patterns. Um, it is possible to say I want to only look at the outliers and then we filtered the list of traces down to things that were slow, so that helps. But again, we're restricted to opening traces in new tabs and investigating them manually and trying to find patterns. Not of no value, but I think is of limited value. So, so far what we've seen is performance, I think is best represented as the shape. Um, uh, and looking at individual traces, you can start to see the differences between slow and fast, but you're left to form your own hypotheses and it's not very data driven. Um, time series data is useful too. Unfortunately, we only have so many dimensions on these monitors. Um, we can overlay uh, like the performance from a day ago as a histogram as well. So this is the shape of performance a day ago and you can see that things are actually faster now than they were uh, yesterday. Uh, and similarly, for an hour ago, there have been some changes. So it's useful to be able to contextualize these things, but I don't think, uh, in my mind, I'd rather have the histogram up front than the time series, because I think it's a lot more telling. You can still see what's changing by overlaying previous data. Um, the next thing I want to show, oh, whoops, I meant to, I forgot it. I took a picture this morning. I like this, I really enjoyed the keynote this morning, and I thought she made a great point about uh, keeping it simple for SLIs, this is kind of what I was just saying, I guess, um, that you really don't need more than this for SLIs. Again, there are a lot of other things you might want to measure, but for SLIs, it's usually just this. Um, someone should take a picture of this and we can have recursive pictures of QCon talks. <laughs> and then I'll give that, uh, if you do that, then I'll present that on Wednesday and we can take a picture of that and then, okay. If you, I'm totally serious. I'll totally do it. Um, all right, so service diagrams. Um, I'll start with a quick talk about some anti-patterns in this area, and then we'll talk about uh, finding um, uh, bottlenecks in common cases and then bottlenecks in outlier cases. So this is, um, I've anonymized this person for their benefit because uh, I'm about to sort of make fun of this presentation, but um, this was a presentation you know, at reInvent, so in front of a lot of people where there's a lot of sort of chest thumping about how awesome it is that Netflix has this amazingly complicated architecture. And my, I mean, I, admittedly it wasn't a talk about observability, but to me this is a, literally a joke. I mean, you can't possibly make sense of this. And most system diagrams for microservices end up being a similar kind of pissing contest where it's like, look at how complicated my diagram is. And it's just like, that's not actionable. I can't determine anything from this at all. Like it's literally illegible. And this is how microservices diagrams look if you try and visualize the whole thing. A service diagram needs to answer a specific question. Like it has to answer a specific question. If it doesn't answer a specific question, I don't know why you're looking at it. It can be helpful for training purposes to have a diagram for your entire system, but what I've seen often is like you'll have a diagram and then you'll, you'll overlay the average latency of those services. Also completely useless. Like a service that has an average latency of 500 milliseconds isn't necessarily worse than one that has 10 millisecond average latency. It's just a different service. So it's all about whether or not that service is affecting someone else's SLI or not. It's the only thing that matters for latency and looking at aggregated stats without a perspective or a point of view in terms of an SLI is totally pointless in my mind. Um, so uh, there's another link. Um, this is to uh, 
you know, actually the same thing. I could have just started where we were a second ago. So this is to um, uh, this particular service. Um, it's, I guess it's actually, this is, I took this snapshot a couple of hours ago, so it actually looks different than it does now, which is interesting. But um, let's say I want to understand the common case latency. So I'm trying to find the bottleneck in this service. Uh, and so maybe I want to say, let's look at everything up to P90. So I'll say, okay, well, let's, let's focus on this. So now we're saying for this SLI, what we care about is the bottom 90% of the transactions because what we're interested in doing is making the average transaction faster. Um, and uh, what we can do is look at a service diagram that what, what's happening here, and this goes back to the traces tracing thing. We started, when we started this thing, um, we kick off trace assemblies for many thousands of traces that are for the specific thing at the specific time. We then restrict it to the 90% of those that are the slow, uh, the fastest actually in this case. And then we build a service diagram just for those traces, but from the perspective of this service that we're actually responsible for. And then we overlay in yellow um, whether or not these other services were bottlenecks for us for this particular operation. So the, what I'm trying to say here is that the things that are yellow are the only things that you can actually change to make your service faster. If you made an optimization in Charger or in Payment Gateway, it would have no effect whatsoever on the bottom 90% 90, 90 of your uh, requests. And, um, and similarly, if you could make uh, this path down to the database or this auth service faster, it would have an effect. Um, and this sort of insight is feasible to kind of get the gist of by looking at individual traces, but it takes a lot of accounting and analysis. But by looking at it in the aggregate, we get this incredibly valuable signal. At least I think it's an incredibly valuable signal. Um, so this is the difference, again, between tracing and traces. We had to make, we, had, we did bias sampling of several thousand traces to start this investigation, and now we're taking advantage of those to deliver a higher level insight. Similarly, I can say I want to look at the, you know, the top 5%. Um, so these are the slow ones. And we'll assemble a new diagram for those uh, dynamically, um, again, based on a couple of hundred traces in this case. And you'll see that the, uh, the distribution is quite different. And now our bottleneck is strictly on the API server. If I don't believe it or I want more evidence, I can go and actually um, select any of these traces uh, for the reserve asset operation, and we'll see uh, what it's talking about. It's talking about um, this thing right here, which we actually saw earlier. Uh, where there's a cache reconnect happening. Um, so the ability, I, uh, in my mind, the confidence I get from this view of a single trace, it's something, like I'm getting something, but it doesn't really hold a candle to the confidence I get from looking at the aggregate view that gives me a much more uh, specific, uh, nuanced perspective on um, what's going on with the brunt of evidence from several hundred data points. Um, and, uh, I personally think this is very powerful, uh, and I, I don't think it's feasible uh, without distributed traces, and it's also not feasible without um, a lot of them, because you need to be able to look at just the outliers to draw this diagram. So like again, this is um, where I think distributed tracing should head. Uh, finally, um, I want to talk about explaining variance, which we haven't really talked about too much. It's sort of implicitly talked about it. Um, so first I want to talk about cardinality. I guess I did have a slide about that. That's good. Um, I knew it was in here somewhere. And then I want to talk about um, what it's like to explore data without those limits and then uh, a problem that introduces and how we can explain variance even uh, more broadly. So um, in 2015, hardly anyone knew the word cardinality. Um, we did know about tags on metrics and this is a metric from our own system. You can tell that something we didn't want to have happen, happened uh, around 1 p.m. And I want to know what's going on. So I group by a tag and I decompose that metric into these pieces. So this is a great example of explaining variance. So we had variance here, we did group by, and now it totally spells it out. All these other tags were not affected, this one tag was affected. So the value of that tag, like imagine this was like a customer or something like that, that's a very valuable lead. So this is an example of um, explaining variance. The problem with cardinality, there's some cardinals there, is, um, is just that there are often so many values for a tag we care about that this is not feasible from a cost standpoint. Um, so um, 
I think it's just the same link from before. I don't even know why I'm clicking on this. But so what I think is um, cool is that I can say, well, here's this reserve asset thing. Um, what if I want to restrict that by some tag? Um, I can say uh, I want to look at a specific host name and autocomplete these high cardinality tags. Um, and uh, oh, actually, sorry, oops, wrong host. Um, I think it's this one. Uh, yeah, so this is a particular host, uh, and I can look at just the traces going through this host. And it's nice to be able to have an unrestricted uh, view of a system like this where you can look at something very granular and still get to the heart of what's going on from a performance standpoint. Um, this is not possible in a metric system. It is possible in a log or structured event system typically, um, although probably not with this sort of data volume. Um, the, uh, the thing that I think is uh, problematic is that the high cardinality data by its very nature, there's so many values for a tag that you're kind of left to guessing, which isn't so useful if you have millions of values. Um, or if you have a hypothesis about a certain host or tag or whatever, you probably got it from another system. So you're exiting your workflow, exiting your tool, having to come back. Um, what I think is more interesting is say, well, you know, let's look at the high percentile data again. And um, what we can do if we have all the distributed traces underneath this is say, well, <clears throat> let's look at those traces and let's actually figure out in the entire distributed trace. So again, in, oops, uh, in like this view, let's look at every single tag and every single log and every single everything on every one of these spans in the entire trace and then correlate that with this segment of the SLI. And then we'll see which tags from potentially totally distant parts of the system are correlated with high, well, not even high latency, it could be low latency, but with whatever I'm interested in from a SLI standpoint, and, and then surface those. So what we can see is that if US West is involved, um, we've overlaid the uh, area where US West is present, and you can see it's almost perfectly correlated with this particular range, which is why it got highlighted. Um, uh, similarly, if this particular customer is involved, it's a very profound correlation. We can also show negative correlations and say if we had this um, cash check operation, those are probably fast. Um, and we can help you understand uh, the data in much more detail. So if I wanted to, uh, and in fact, if I want to, I can actually replace this query with um, a query that's augmented by this high cardinality tag, a particular customer ID. And indeed, you can see that when this one customer is involved, the, the, per the performance is quite different. And this is obviously artificial data, but this is all based on very real scenarios that we see in production. Like we have a, a customer that had, um, there are 50,000, they have 50,000 customers themselves, they're a big SaaS, and one customer was doing something silly, and it was so silly that it pushed their P99 way up, and by, um, uh, looking at a particular range of the latency distribution, um, they were able to automatically detect that that customer was the uh, problematic user. Um, and this is all, of, of course, kind of dynamic. So I, I think of this as being like a pretty profound thing in that you're able to understand um, correlation at a distance and in a way that's completely dynamic. And it, uh, I would compare it maybe to um, to this graph where we were able to see that this was slow. I would never have noticed that US West 1 was on here and I certainly wouldn't have known that US West 1 is like almost entirely responsible for this problematic mode. So it's the difference between being able to visualize the critical path and then being able to see the pattern in the data which is very evident if you look at it in this visualization. Um, and that can only be grabbed from the distributed traces uh, but um, isn't visible until you have a distributed tracing system that can actually uh, present that information. So. Um, Oops, uh, yeah, so that's it. Um, what we've learned is that microservices are really great for reducing comms overhead, but then you can't communicate with anyone anymore, so it makes observability really hard. Um, distributed traces are literally necessary if you want to make sense of this. You don't, by any means, need to buy LightStep, but I promise you, you need distributed tracing of some sort um, if you're going to uh, exist in a microservices world. Um, and that distributed tracing really needs to be much more than just the traces themselves. Uh, 
Again, this is not necessarily an advertisement for LightStep. Um, there are other tracing solutions out there, but I think you should not stop at being able to see a trace. You should be able to make a much more principled analysis of your system. Um, and finally, that I would like to see observability framed more around services. I think that's a, the natural unit of currency for problem solving in a microservices world. Uh, with that, I've got 15 minutes left, but I wanted to leave time for questions, so I'll, I'll take them at this point. Um, yeah, we had an announcement today. You can now actually use LightStep without talking to a sales rep. Yay. Um, and uh, we're at booth number three if you want to talk to someone about this stuff. Questions? Oh, there's a mic coming. Oh, yeah, and thanks, everyone, for coming. If you're not going to stay for the questions, I appreciate it. Is there any, can you tell me about the impact it has on existing systems if you add this tracing onto it? In terms of overhead? Yes. It's uh, not measurable. I mean, it's, it's like too low to be, it's in the noise of the measurement. Yeah, so the Dapper paper does describe the performance metrics in detail for Dapper. Um, and th there's a misunderstanding that the sampling that Dapper did was for overhead reasons in the application processes themselves. The sampling that we did was mostly to protect Dapper's cost. If you sampled 100% of the data, it would have cost Google way too much money to centralize the data. We did, at one for 16 sampling in Dapper, you couldn't observe the effect anymore in the application, as opposed to one for 10,000. Um, but the one for 16 assumed that you're writing all the tracing data to local disk, and the only issues we had were with uh, contention uh, in the kernel uh, on the disk. And so if you actually write the data out over the network, the uh, amount of data here per process is not that big of a deal. Um, I don't want to say that you couldn't possibly see it, but like in LightStep's case, we have a circuit breaker where if you wrote a for loop and just logged data to LightStep as fast as possible, we would cut that off and then you'd see in the UI, oh, you shouldn't do that or whatever. Um, but for a normal application or for any of our logo customers or whatever, they're all running it all the time in production. For every transaction, yeah. One more, one question. Uh, you s so, uh, LightStep looks super awesome, yeah? But uh, it's still displaying data. It's not doing anything with it, basically. Mm -hmm. Do you guys consider taking it one more step and actually start making it take decision for your system? That's an interesting question. I mean, uh, I thought about it. Um, there's nothing quite like the feeling of getting that wrong. Uh, especially if you're a vendor. <laughs> um, I, I think it makes a lot of sense in CICD, and we have had customers who've scripted rollbacks based on a performance regression, but that's honestly, you don't need a full tracing system for that. You can observe that you're having a performance regression locally uh, and then roll back. I would love to see that happen, and there are other things that have nothing to do with performance around security and compliance, resource management, things like that, that I think are better candidates for actually intervening in the system. But my, it's sort of the Hippocratic oath of observability is first you no harm, and I, I don't want to uh, write a tool that automatically modifies the system without being 100% certain it's going to benefit it, and, and I just don't honestly think we're there yet as an industry. Yes. I can repeat the question if you. Um, can you expand on the, the support in the reactive systems? You mean like ACA, like that kind of stuff? Yes. That's a really good question too. So, I mean, there's open tracing support for ACA, um, and thus it's not that difficult to get the raw data into LightStep. It depends on what the system is built to do. Some people use those sorts of things for non-latency sensitive workloads, and I found that a lot of tooling like LightStep um, and certainly including LightStep, isn't really built for non-latency sensitive workloads in terms of features. Um, if you just wanted like a general purpose debugging tool for that, you'd probably want features that we wouldn't have, although you can literally do it. However, if the data, if the workload is latency sensitive, then I think it works quite nicely. Um, it's just a matter of, of that question. If, if you are latency sensitive, a lot of this data can be useful. The one caveat is that sometimes the basic span model is problematic in that you 
most of the interesting latency is between actors, so you like in queue here and DQ there, and you want to know how long it took in between those two things, and that can be a difficult thing to do with a span-based tracing model. Uh, if you want, I can talk to you later about, that can be hacked around, but it's a hack. Um, and so that's the caveat there. Liz. You mentioned the SLIs a bunch. H how are they shown in LightStep? How are they shown in LightStep? Um, we or show- in general, how do you recommend people track SLIs versus their tracing? Uh, that's a better question, yeah. I mean, we do have them in LightStep, but I've, I'll try to steer, you don't need to talk about LightStep for that. I mean, I think that uh, the error rate can be expressed as just a simple time series. Um, the operation rate, I think, can also be expressed as simple time series in my mind. And then latency, I really want to see represented at least as like a, a, some sort of distribution, whether it's a histogram or not. I think it's, it's sort of maddening to just see the percentile, um, which is often incorrect in a lot of the systems that people actually pay for. What do you think, Liz? You're smart. You, you have, probably have opinions about this too. I think that uh, when you have to context switch tools, it creates a bunch of friction. So if you are using a separate metrics and tracing, then you are potentially in for a lot more pain than if you can somehow get those two to integrate nicely. I agree, that is yeah. my personal opinion. I agree with you. Uh, uh, that we do have those in the product for that reason, and uh, it's frustrating to switch between tools for sure. Yes. Um, what are your thoughts on Jaeger? Love it. Uh, Jaeger's awesome. Uh, uh, Yuri is a personal friend of mine, and I work with him all the time on open tracing stuff. Uh, I think it's, uh, in terms of velocity as an open source product, is probably the best thing out there for tracing right now. And it has a lot of potential, too. They've done some really cool stuff that we don't do for what it's worth. I think they have some nice tools to diff traces that I think are really cool. And internally at Uber, they've done some analysis that, uh, that I, I think is really interesting uh, that's like edge analysis that goes down to the depths of the system. I think Jaeger is a very good piece of technology. Yes. I, I can repeat the question. And you want to try to deal with that multi-in and assign probabilistic Do we have tools that can work with probabilistic things? So you have, you're saying, uh, I'm just repeating the question. So you have um, uh, things coming in batch and you want to assign weights to them so that you can kind of get the right data out the other side. Um, yes. Um, but uh, I think that can be tricky. Sometimes when you say batching, I worry that you're, you're like glomming requests together and then flushing them out all at once. And those sorts of things are historically really difficult. We wrote about that a bit in the Dapper paper too. If the transactions are all equal, then it's, it works beautifully. But when you start aggregating the transactions and they kind of converge, that's a difficult thing to, to trace and to analyze for any system, I think. Does that answer your question? Sort of? It's hard, it's hard. There's no, there's no silver bullet on that either. Other questions? Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to take more afterwards. <laughs>